here and to present uh, our work. So what uh, I'm going to talk about today is uh, about the uh, formation of blood vessels, uh, which is, uh, of course, of uh, paramount importance in uh, organ formation and growth, and the imbalance of this uh, formation of growth uh, and growth of blood vessels uh, gives rise to many diseases, so it's very important to understand it. This is uh, work with uh, my colleagues at my university, uh, uh, Mariano Alvaro, Manuel Carretero, and Filippo Terragni, and also done with Vincenzo Capasso uh, at the University of Milan and Bjorn Birnir at uh, UC Santa Barbara. Okay, so here in uh, here you see uh, the formation, the vascularization of retina in uh, mice and men, so to speak. So as you know, uh, mice are born blind, and uh, in a few days, from the optical nerve, come out a lot of uh, capilla uh, capillaries that extend all around the retina and give rise to that. In uh, primates, the process is different. They start vascularizing in the womb. So for instance, in the man, it's about 16 weeks when this process starts. And so it goes on. So here you see some secondary uh, vascularization. And uh, there is a process of, uh, you see, from some kind of chaotic structure to get a more regular one by taking into account the circulation of the blood here, the capillaries that do not get enough blood circulation atrophy and die, so it's like pruning, and in the end you get some more or less regular pattern. What is triggering this process is the lack of oxygen in some of the cells of the tissue. So, uh, so these cells that uh, lack oxygen, they emit some growth factors, when the growth factor arrives to a primary vessel, these walls of this vessel open up and emit these capillaries that advance towards the emission of the growth factor. And in a normal circumstance, once they arrive there, they uh, consume the growth factor substances and emit some uh, other antiangiogenic uh, substances. So they equilibrate like that. In uh, processes such as cancer, what happens is that uh, this part is the same. However, instead of uh, stopping, the uh, tumor emits more and more growth factors and grows thanks to the uh, vascularization and eventually can uh, send cancerous cells through the uh, blood to some other places. So this is a more or less complicated uh, view graph. Um, here you see that when the growth factor arrives to the primary vessel, the walls open up and they start emitting these uh, capillaries that are led by special tip cells that are have a lot of philopodia and they are censoring, for instance, the chemical gradient of the substance and trying to climb up to the source of that. Then, uh, of course, these cells are uh, moving on top of an extracellular matrix. So not only they sense the chemical gradient, but they also sense like the gradient of uh, adhesion, which is a process called uh, aptotaxis, or the gradient of stiffness called durotaxis. So these are more or less complicated uh, uh, process. One thing that they do is uh, these uh, tip cells are uh, not proliferating, and uh, they just open up a way, and then there are stuck stalk cells that are following them. These ones proliferate and just follow this one. And after a while, then there is a blood circulation that is established. Uh, another important mechanism is that every now and then you, you get branching of these capillaries. So from one capillary, you may get uh, eventually more. And the other thing in a process that is not really understood is that uh, uh, when two of these 
capillaries come together, they can build a bridge, which is called anastomosis, and uh, they get these loops that uh, help uh, the blood circulation. So, so for instance, you see a bunch of loops being formed at the first stage of the angiogenesis. So this process is called angiogenesis. Uh, it's a rather complicated process. It encompasses uh, time scales from seconds or less to days, uh, length scales from the microns to centimeters and more. Uh, and therefore, if you want to model, which is what we wanted to do, uh, this process, uh, you need a really a multi-scale uh, model. The model I'm going to present here, which are r uh, rather simple, they are good for uh, distances that are large compared to the cell size and uh, you know, relatively long time. And uh, what happens here is that you have a first wave of more or less random vascularization followed by a much more slow process of this regularization. I'm going to care only about the first part of the process, which is the easiest one. This is an example of what happens when you have uh, imbalances. So for instance, this is a disease called age-related macular degeneration. It happens to uh, older people. So you see uh, uh, here the eye. This is the retina is back here. And there is the macula, which is where the images are formed. Now, this macula has some vascularization underneath here, and then some layers and a membrane called the Bruch membrane. Turns out this disease has uh, like two phases. In one of them is like forming of this kind of trash here that buckles the Bruch membrane. And in the so-called wet phase of the uh, AMD, what happens is that you get angiogenesis through the Bruch membrane. Then these capillaries arrive to the bases where the um, uh, chromophores are are living, these cylinders and cones, they are uh, very makeshift capillaries, so they, they just release liquid there, and this liquid just knocks down the uh, chromophores, and, and then you get blind spots. Uh, so far, people who treat this disease, what they do is, uh, okay, you get a shot of anti-angiogenic uh, substances, and then you have a lease on vision for about one or two months, after which you go back to another list and get another social neuro shot. Um, <coughs> you know, a lot of this uh, research is done empirically. So for instance, if you try to get a, a treat anti-angiogenic substance, well, it's animal experimentation. This is a, a rat cornea. So you put some pellet of uh, angiogenic substances, release it, and you see how the uh, vascular, uh, vascularity reaches that. Then you try different drugs and see which one do better. Okay. Of course, uh, if uh, we had uh, better models of how this process happened and, uh, and how the substances work, in the end, this should be like a, a control process. If we, you want to control this uh, process in an optimal way, maybe to stop it before it, it arrives there. Um, there are many models since this field, for instance, the field of uh, tumor-induced angiogenesis started in 1971 with Judah uh, Folkman. Uh, so the first models were done in the 70s, and they were mostly reaction diffusion models. Uh, the ones I'm interested in, I want to, to have an idea about how this uh, angiogenic network is formed. Well. Uh, they are of this tip cell migration form. The idea is you follow the tip cells, and the trajectories of these tip cells are going to be the capillaries. That's a huge simplification, which is not really true, but uh, it makes things uh, more tractable. Then there are uh, these uh, more complicated stock uh, tip cell dynamics. Sometimes the stock cells crawl over the tip cell and take over. But uh, for the models I'm presenting here, I'm going to ignore that. Then if you want to understand 
up to taxis and to the taxis and all of that, how the, the cells crawl on top of the extracellular matrix, you need more detailed models than the ones I am going to use. For instance, uh, typical ones that people use are the cellular POTS model, which is like the POTS model of statistical mechanics, in which you have different flavors. When one flavor, the uh, pixel is occupied by a cell or by extracellular matrix or liquid or whatever. So those ones are rather expensive computationally. And then there are models that combine some of these things. Um, these are some people who have uh, done models, and these are experimentalists. Uh, what is common to many of these models is that you do a uh, lot of computations and check uh, whether the model works compared to some experiments, but there is not really that much analysis of the model. So in the work I'm going to present, we try to, to do a statistical mechanics analysis of this. Um, so uh, this is our goal. We want to understand these advancing and growing networks by using statistical non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. And uh, the idea is we better use the simplest model possible, because if we don't even understand that one, it's useless to continue. Okay. So the, the model we do is uh, a rather simple one. Uh, as I said, the important thing is to follow the tip, because the trajectories are then the capillary. So that allows us to use uh, po uh, point masses and see what they do. We are going to model the branching uh, by some stochastic process, which I'll show. Then each time that there is a new branch, it means there is a new tip. And what I'm going to do is to count density of active tips. Uh, the extension of the tip motion is going to be like a Brownian particle subject to gradients of the chemical growth fac uh, factor and things like that. Um, okay, then the we are going to do a continuum modeling of the growth factor just with reaction diffusion equations coupled to the stochastic process of the motion of the tips. And then the anastomosis process in two dimensions is going to be very simple. The minute uh, active tip reaches the an, uh, another capillary, which may be the trajectory of a different tip, stops there, and we stop counting them. So this is like a birth and death process plus uh, some Brownian motion. And all the other things we ignore. OK, so this is an outcome of, uh, of uh, simulating the model. This is just put here to, uh, here we have a, on the X y-axis the primary vessel where which is issuing these uh, uh, blood vessels. Here you have the source of growth factor, which is supposed to be a Ga Gaussian source. These are the level curves of the um, growth factor. And so you see that uh, you know, this thing advances. Every now and then, one tip reaches the trajectory, another stops there. Sometimes it branches, you can see there. And when it arrives to the source of the growth factor, we stop counting. Okay. So this is what we want to understand. Okay, so this is a stochastic model that we are going to do. As I said, we only count active tips. So the vessel extension is just Newton's law with uh, some force, which is a chemotaxis, proportional to the gradient of the growth factor. This is a friction and uh, maybe you have white noise there. Then you have a random process of tip branching, which is that every now and then, uh, one of these tips splits into two. We are going, uh, according to this, this is like a saturation law that is typical for this process. And we are going to assume, because the uh, geometry we have is Cartesian, very simple, we are going to assume that the new tips are essentially oriented with a velocity v0 along the x-axis. Okay. We can be more sophisticated, but that's not going to uh, matter that much. Uh, and then the anastomosis, what I just said. Whenever a uh, tip reaches another vessel, then uh, it makes a bridge, makes a loop for circulating the blood that stops there. Okay. So this is a stochastic process that the 
course, you need an equation for the for the growth factor, which is just a diffusion. And uh, this term says that the uh, growth factor is consumed by the advancing peak. And it's consumed at a, at a uh, rate that is proportional to the elongation of the tip, which is for a time dt, uh, the modulus of the velocity times dt. And uh, okay, this is just the, the density of the tips. These are really not delta functions, but the Gaussian with a certain uh, small uh, variance. Okay, so we assume that the initial uh, concentration is Gaussian, and uh, you have some injecting flow uh, at uh, the origin of the uh, growth factor and uh, zero flux boundary condition elsewhere in the boundaries. So uh, how do we understand this? Well, uh, the first idea you may have is that uh, the branching is going to be so efficient at creating new tips that there are going to be a lot of them. So if there are tons of these uh, uh, Brownian particles, you can think of the law large numbers, define a relative density. So let's say that N0 is the original, uh, the sorry, the initial number of tips. So if this density when this number goes to infinity, uh, converges to, to this uh, uh, density, relative density, then you can get uh, some kind of deterministic equations for the, uh, for the density of active tips. And uh, there are, uh, our collaborator even proved a lot of theorems about uh, why this is so mathematically. Uh, well, if you do the simulations, then things are not so clear because uh, in 2D doesn't work. You cannot get a lot of tips because the anastomosis is very efficient. Uh, and uh, what happens is that you never get more than 100 tips. And if you measure the fluctuations, they are hu huge. And therefore, this law of large numbers in this particular two-dimensional case that we are studying doesn't work too well. So the recipe is known since Gibbs, so we do ensemble averages to define the density. So we take uh, a lot of uh, initial conditions on a certain ensemble, and then we do at each time uh, averages over the replicas of the stochastic process. Now with this trick, uh, turns out that you can define uh, the density this would be the empirical density, the sum of the replicas of these. These are just Gaussian functions, so they are perfectly known. And uh, you have n, uh, this n of t omega is the number of active tips at uh, time t, which of course varies because it sometimes grows, sometimes decreases. So we assume that uh, this go converges to some density. And if you eliminate the velocity, then you have a, a density of tips, which um, also converges to that, supposedly. Okay, so these are the equations that we derived. This part is totally conventional because it's like uh, going from the uh, stochastic uh, Langevin equations to the Fokker-Planck version of the equations. So this is the uh, friction. This uh, is the chemotactic forcing, and then here you have the just the convection, and this is due to the Brownian motion. The new terms are these two terms. So this one is what you would expect by putting a source of, of new tips created according to the random process. So it's proportional to that number, and since uh, it's selected with a Gaussian around this value, you just put that. Now, uh, what uh, uh, we did, and uh, and people didn't realize it before, is that the anastomosis term uh, can be this way. The idea, basically, to, to figure out why this is so is that uh, one tip at time t arrives and touches the, uh, an existing capillary. But that existing capillary arrives at that particular uh, point at previous time. 
So now if you think of binary collisions, you are colliding uh, uh, a time. Okay, thanks. So you are colliding uh, this with the previous time. Doesn't matter the velocity. So you get that. This gamma is a fitting parameter that we compute the by just comparing stochastic and deterministic solutions of this equation. Uh, well, this is just what you would expect given the previous thing. Uh, I'm going to skip the boundary conditions here. Is what you would imagine. The only delicate thing is about what are the boundary conditions for the density of active tips. So we say that we are injecting some stuff at uh, x equals zero. So our boundary condition should be compatible with that. If you integrate this thing, you get that at uh, time equals zero, the flux is some known thing. And uh, here we don't count tips after they arrive. So if you integrate this, you get that the density is equal to that. OK, so this are typical things in kinetic theory. This uh, view graph shows how to fit the parameter by counting the total number of tips and asking them to be the same deterministic and ensemble average. Uh, this is a comparison between the deterministic uh, and the stochastic. This is the deterministic part, the stochastic uh, solution of the stochastic equation. This is the ensemble average density. So you see that essentially you get a maximum at some point that is advancing towards the source of the growth factor. The deterministic thing reproduces it more or less. Uh, the shape of this doesn't change. The reason why you don't see here any tips is that there are so many already that any branching uh, tip that is created there is immediately killed. So essentially, the number back here is very small. Uh, OK, I'm, I'm going to skip all the formal stuff. Uh, and uh, now I'm going to tell you how uh, we understood this kind of analytically. Um, because it turns out that uh, if you cut if you cut here, essentially what you see is a propagating solitary wave, which is stable. And because of that, I'm going to call that a soliton, even though it's not a soliton in the sense of integ completely integrable systems. But it's an attractor, so for me, it's uh, good enough. OK, so we want to describe this motion of this soliton. And uh, uh, what you can do is, OK, you start chopping the equation, go to the uh, overdamp limit, which is kind of reasonable given small velocities. Then you can prove by using perturbation methods that uh, you get that, which is sort of what you would expect by chopping the, the inertia, you get this equation. Uh, and now if you decide that you ignore the noise and uh, this f is, is a constant, so you do a dominant balance between the source and sink terms, advection, and this goes to move with velocity c, you get uh, some equation which happens to have this exact solution, which is like the soliton or the Kortebeck debris equation water waves, except that it has two parameters. One is the velocity, the other is a shape parameter. And to, of course, uh, the growth factor moves slowly. And there are a lot of things we left out. So we can approximate this by the moving soliton with slowly varying so-called collective coordinates. We figure out a way to get equations for these collective coordinates, uh, which uh, probably I should not tell you the details, but uh, more or less is a recipe uh, written here. You can extend it to 2D solitons, so not only this one-dimensional cut that we did, but you can also do it in 2D. And uh, it turns out that then you what you do is you take a picture. OK, this is a comparison of uh, this is the simulation of the deterministic pulse. At this time, the soliton is fully formed. We take a picture, calculate some specially averaged coefficient of these equations that I didn't show you. And then we can reconstruct the soliton, which is here. And it compares very well with the 
solution of the deterministic equation. Now, once you do that, you can think, OK, can I do this for getting the deterministic equation? The answer is yes. You had to select the anastomosis coefficient in some way, but essentially the soliton describes what is going on. OK, so this is uh, one of the things that you can do. Uh, of course, the other thing, and this was a surprise, is, OK, how good is this? Because you are taking ensemble averages over many replicas, and uh, this simply doesn't work for a patient or something. But it turns out that the uh, trajectory of the soliton describes the center of mass of the angiogenic uh, network. Therefore, by following that, you have uh, an idea about what is going on. So this uh, center of mass is a self-averaging uh, quantity that uh, gives you the same answer with one replica than with the ensemble average. OK, so that's how you can do this with other models, like for random walk, you get uh, a master equation instead of Fokker plan, but otherwise works the same. And uh, OK, so this is what uh, we have done. Uh, essentially, we are uh, working now uh, trying to derive the same or a related time of, of description from POTS and agent models, which is a more complicated thing. And, uh, and essentially, our goal would be to get somehow uh, to control this. And of course, we had to put the blood circulation, a lot of things that uh, we had not done. OK, thank you. <laughs>